typographical error. It's similar. It's exactly it's disjointed. Okay, I'm running. Okay, the latest scandal uh, um, having to do with the origins of Christianity is the uh, Jesus' wife papyrus. Again, you can Google this. You can see it on my own site. Uh, it'll give you the whole story. You can go to Harvard Divinity School under Professor Karen King. You'll, you'll get the story. You can go to Professor James Tabor's blog. You'll get the inside info. So what is that all about, this Jesus papyrus? Why is it so important? Why did it make front page news around the world? And how come something that was front page news around the world just a few weeks ago has disappeared? It's gone. It's worthless. It was amazing. It was front page news. It changed everything. Suddenly it's worthless. It's a forgery. It's a piece of garbage. Let's not talk about it. We move on. How did that happen? That shows you the efficacy, how effective the, uh, the sleeper agents of Christian theology masquerading as academics and blogging their little hearts away, how they're able to discredit something that's of significance. What happens? There are these Coptic papyri. You know, papyri, uh, uh, papyrus is something that's written on. They usually date around 4th century. Uh, very important non-canonical uh, uh, papyri were found in a place called Nag Hammadi in Egypt uh, around 1947. And they're known as the Nag Hammadi uh, uh, Gospels or papyri. And uh, what are they? Basically, they are non-canonical Gospels. What does that mean? You have the canon, the official kosher four Gospels of the New Testament that they were given the stamp of approval by the church. And then you have non-canonical Gospels. That means there were other Christians, you know, 2,000 years ago or 1,600 years ago that believed in a different form of Christianity that, than the Christianity that won out in Rome. Okay, so you have canonical, that's Roman theology, Christian theology. And then you have non-canonical, stuff that other people believed that the church fathers called heresy, nonsense. These people were bad people. So what happens in the 4th century, Constantine, the Roman emperor, uh, uh, basically takes Christianity, which at that point is on the margins, and mainstreams it. He makes it one step closer to becoming the official religion of, of, of uh, the Roman Empire. And he declares himself to be a Christian, sort of. And basically he has a very nice traditional Roman way, Roman imperial way, of dealing with people he disagrees with. He kills them. He kills them and he burns their books. It's very interesting. This is how Christianity became orthodoxy. They decided this is kosher, this isn't. And whoever believes in the non-kosher Christianity will kill you and will burn your books. And then we'll say there is no other version of Christianity. Of course there is no other version of Christianity because we killed the people who believed something else and we burned their books. But what happens, some of these people actually hid their books. For example, in Egypt, in Nag Hammadi, a place called Nag Hammadi, people who had a different version of Christianity stuck their Gospels into these uh, uh, vases. And those vases were found after like 1,600 years, or in 1947, uh, in Egypt. And they were published, and they were translated, and little bits of them keep appearing in, in the antiquities market, because some Bedouin finds... Uh, uh, a vase. It's got some uh, ancient writings in it. He slices it up and starts selling them to antiquities dealers sentence by sentence so he can make some money. And every once in a while some scholar gets one of these things and they go, wow, look at this, the gospel of this or the gospel of that or a gospel we didn't know. That's how this papyrus where Jesus calls somebody, looks like Mary Magdalene, his wife, has came out. It's a fourth century papyrus it looks like. And it's telling a story that wasn't invented in the 4th century. It's probably an older story that Professor Karen King from Harvard Divinity School dates to the 2nd century. Now, this is very, very important. Why? Because until now, people said that the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married was utter nonsense. It's Dan Brown. It's Da Vinci Code. It's fiction. It's people looking to make money. It's a Hollywood film. It ain't reality. It ain't history. We don't have to deal with it. Why? Because there isn't a single textual reference from ancient days 
saying that Jesus was married to anybody, certainly not Mary Magdalene. Now, that was the mantra. No textual evidence, no textual evidence, no textual evidence. Now, it's actually not true. We have, for example, in these alternative Gospels from uh, um, um, the Gnostic Gospels, they're called, the Searchers of Wisdom, an alternative Christianity. We have uh, uh, Gospels where Mary Magdalene is called uh, koinos. I think I'm pronouncing it properly, but it's Greek for wife. But you can also translate it companion. So people translate it companion. That's not wife. Mary Magdalene, she doesn't say wife. It says companion. Jesus had a female companion what did they do they played chess together what's what's this companion first century rabbi that's what he's called in the gospels rabbin rabbi or rabbi today's got a female companion walking around with him a companion but that's how they translate it why because companion she's a disciple she's anything but a wife along comes this papyrus that says wife you can't translate it any other way wife what do the sleeper agents of Christian theology reflexively do when something comes up that they don't like? First you say forgery. Then if you can't say forgery, you say not important. Then if you don't say important, very late or very early, you got to demonize the messenger, marginalize the artifact, and discredit the whole thing. And this is exactly what they did when they came to the Jesus papyrus.